And we have a conversation on this right now, considering a number of you have been reacting to this. Dr. Rashid Draman is Executive Director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Martin Pebo is also private legal practitioner, uh, one of the foremost human rights lawyers we have in this country. Uh, gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Mr. Kansi. Uh, and I'll start off with you, uh, Lawyer Martin Pebo, as an officer of the courts, and having followed this particular case quite closely, the outcome today of the Supreme Court, considering the Speaker's application, did that strike you differently from what the Supreme Court judges who sat on this case thought? Yes, uh, absolutely. Why is that? Absolutely. I, I was hopeful. I was hoping that uh, the Speaker's application through his lawyer, Tado Sorry, was going to succeed, at least in part. At least in part. You see, uh, let's go cut to the chase, go to the main point. You see, the Supreme Court says, uh, looking at Article 2, they could make the order beyond 10 days. Let's say, I'm not persuaded. You see, Mr. Kansi, we are all lawyers. We and the Supreme Court judges. It's the same training we're given in law school. It's one universal exam. You don't write any extra exams apart from the law school exams to go to the Supreme Court. It's the same. It's the same thing. Every lawyer, even a lawyer, who graduated uh, this in last week. You know, I've been mentioning Denis' example. Yes, the exams, Denis wrote and passed to become a lawyer. That's it. If Denis is rising to the Supreme Court, sometimes High Court and Court of Appeals, a few exams here and there. But Supreme Court, nobody writes any exams to go to the Supreme Court. So it's the same text everybody is reading. I, from what I read, I don't think that is what Article 2 is saying. Because we have what we call settled practice. If you want to see that the practice is settled, even you check the proceedings of 18th October, the lawyer who applied, Park we see a baby, he himself told the court, is there, you can check, that he wants the order for 10 days because that is the settled practice. Settled. If the court is going to go uh, bring a new rule, it's not done in the fashion the Supreme Court did. Then they had to give very detailed reasons to persuade lawyers and other uh, persons interested in reading. But if you read the orders of the 18th of October, no detailed reasoning and persuasion was offered. So this today's resort to Article 2 is not persuasive at all. And the more the Supreme Court digs in its heels, the more it will lose us because you're losing lawyers. You're losing lawyers, and that shouldn't be. Because, you see, for us to say openly that we, don't, we disagree with the Supreme Court, it doesn't come lightly. you. So before you see a lawyer say, I disagree with the Supreme Court on X, Y, Z, then it tells you it's indefensible. Because when it's 50-50, people will just rather shut up because they say, well, it's a discretion. And, you know, each person, it, it, the Supreme Court judge has the discretion, and he exercises it that way. So, well... We may not make too much noise when it's 50-50. But this one is very settled, very, very, very settled, that if you go alone, that's one party and the lawyer, go alone to the court for an injunction, and in this case, and it applies to this day of execution, usually that order is for 10 days. Check the proceedings of 18th October and the orders and made on that day. The Supreme Court did not persuade anybody as to why it should, the order should last to the end of the case. And I believe today's resort to Article 2 is too late. It's just too little too late. The, the court is losing us. And you see the Afrobarometer uh, thing on uh, this and trust in the judiciary. You see it's coming down from 65% in 2012. The latest one says, what, 35%. So from 2012 to tw uh, 2024, about how many, 12 years on, the trust in the judiciary has been halved. So I thought that the court would be mindful of some of those things. And the way, you know, in recent times, many people are talking, many people are railing and railing. So I thought the court would have been mindful of that and seen how to handle this application so that at least parliament's dignity is restored to a certain extent. But today's 
standing in court throughout the proceedings. I didn't get that at all. It's a disappointment. Now, now you see the trust in the judiciary will go down and down because then quickly, right? You see, even the matter of justice and as Garu was raised that he was an MPP parliamentary candidate. Mm -hmm. That's also something they should have just well, removed. Well, well the Chief Justice's response to that was that this, this matter was a constitutional matter and not a political matter. And so uh, that the said judge being on the panel really w was immaterial to the concerns that uh, the Speaker's lawyer, uh, Tadio Sorry, had raised. Does that cut it oh, for you? I'm sure you... I'm sure once again, you know, I'm not persuaded. This this case, this case is as political as anything else. This this is a case between NDC and MPP. Straight. No curve, no bend. This is a case between MPP and NDC. So when you have a justice who uh, is a member of the MPP, no, you don't empanel him. You don't empanel him. You see, the thing, you see, cut to the chase uh, is just come down to, well, I have the power and I have decided. That's where it is. But no, it should be persuasion with lots of authorities, okay, reasoning that anybody reading it will say that, hmm, yeah, this one, I, I give up, I surrender. But that reason that was given, no, it doesn't go far at all. This case is MPP versus NDC. I'm saying so. That's the way I see this case. You can't just say because they've raised constitutional provisions, then it's not NDC and MPP. It's NDC versus MPP. Simple. Even lay people, when the Supreme Court said it, there were lay people in court who were whispering that, ah, but this one, they're not so outside. This one is MPP versus NDC. That's why I said, so you are left with a feeling that it just shows that, well, I have the power. I've decided. Yeah, you, at the end of the day, that's just what you are left with, but not superior legal reasoning. No, 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 no. I didn't see that. Well, Dr. No, no. and uh, much people hold on a bit for me. Dr. Sidraman, I just want to bring you in. Uh, the, the Chief Justice, in fact, to, to uh, at least come to terms with the se sentiments of the people, uh, at the ending of the proceedings today, she expressed the sentiment that you have been expressing all the while, that yes, indeed, this is, this, we are in a constitutional crisis. Parliament is not sitting. But with the outcome of today, does it contribute to the correction of that crisis that we find ourselves in? If you can unmute for me. Can you hear me, Alfred? Clearly. Yes. So I, I was saying, um, as the court proceedings were going on, I was thinking about our 275 members of parliament and how they would each individually feel about the outcome. Um, because <laughs> at the end of the day, most of what they do in the house, um, I think is based on a lot of understanding and a lot of compromise amongst them. Uh, sometimes even to the detriment of the law that they are fighting in court uh, right now. Um, sometimes, um, you know, the numbers are not there in parliament, but because they want the flow of the work of parliament, you know, nobody raises any objection. And so far as no objection is raised, um, the speaker allows the work of parliament to go on. Um, you know, the more we see, you know, this kind of legal arguments, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't go into even the merits or demerits of whatever happened in court today. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm just thinking that, you know, uh, the court getting into the space of parliament in, uh, in an era when you know, the numbers are very tight. Um, it, it, it creates, you know, a situation where, for instance, I mean, if someone is aggrieved by the outcome, I mean, no, I mean, depending on how they read it, then 
we might see a situation where they will say, okay, we are also going to apply the law in parliament and right. we are going to invoke, invoke every single rule in the book. Right. Uh, then the crisis deepens. Then members of parliament will go into the house and, you know, nothing would happen. Then um, we are still in the situation where, you know, where which group sits is still not resolved. And that is something that will be resolved politically. Right. But, but also, so that essentially uh, you come to the point where that concern about using the, the courts or relying on the courts overly to address political matters, in your view, could, could set a dangerous precedent? Um, yes, indeed, because like I was saying, if you want to use a law always, I mean, the law is there. I think everybody has to obey the law in Parliament, the first one to obey the law because they make the laws and so on. Um, but I think there are times when, um, especially now, we are losing time every single day, right? And there's mm -hmm. serious government business that needs to be done. Um, everybody can be ordered to obey the Supreme Court, um, the Speaker, the NDC caucus, and so on. Uh, then they go into Parliament, and then they boycott Parliament, or they refuse to do um, the work of Parliament. Decisions become very difficult to arrive at, and then it goes on and on and on. Or when they sit in the House, and then they start invoking all the rules that they can invoke. And uh, and then, uh, Alfred, one fundamental thing for me is, I mean, I had uh, arguments about representation and right. how the people of, I mean, all the people who queued and voted for mm. for the, the MPs are going to be denied representation, representation in Parliament mm. for these uh, few weeks. But how, how about the people in SAL that, I mean, people have been asking, and some of us have said our parliament is not properly constituted, so long as there are some people who are not represented right from day one of right. the eighth parliament. How about those people? I mean, is there anybody who is speaking for them? Is the court, is the court aware of their case? Um, are they less important than Aguna Suedro and, uh, and all the other constituencies yeah, that we uh, have? Yes. Aguna West, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I think these are fundamental questions that we need to ask. Okay. But see, uh, people, and while we conclude on this, you talk about, uh, Council, you talk about how today's outcome further deepens the mistrust for the court and that is, is disconnected from the sentiments of people. But if you listen to the Chief Justice, she expressed those same sentiments that we're in a constitutional crisis. She, she is well aware of what's happening. That's not soothing for you? Yes. So, uh, you know, saying, what, what do I say? What I can say is that... Um, you know, I may not be in the head of the Chief Justice, so I'll hasten slowly. Uh, what I can say, and which I've said is that, well, for me, what transpired in court today did not show that we were, the court was uh, ready to do something to dissolve the constitutional crisis. That's not what I saw. That's not what I saw. There is even mediation. So a lot of stuff could have been done to dissolve the crisis, as I said, I, you know, when you look, you see law as a tool of social engineering. You see, we use law to bring society together. We use law to promote development, etc. So there are different ways that the court could have gone about this to be able to help dissolve the tension. As I said, it was simple for me. The court would simply have vacated the part of the order that says that the order suspending the speaker's ruling is to stay to the end. Mr. Okan said, as for that point, look, no matter what you say, that's one point that if you survey most lawyers, you get most lawyers agreeing right. that once the speaker was not heard, you couldn't have made that order that this, you are suspending his order until you finish hearing the case. I right. think the Supreme Court 
just didn't want to eat humble pie. That one, it will be difficult. We will never agree. No, I won't agree with the Supreme Court. You don't do that. So they should have eaten humble pie, rolled back that part of the order. And then, you know, as a party to George, you see, at this strict thing, I have the power. I will rule how I want. That's the way I understood it. Well, the, the, the road or the path to November 11. Uh, is one to watch, and the conversation has already started right from now till the next couple of weeks ahead of us. Lawyer Martin Pebble, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight, and also to you, uh, Dr. Rashid Rahman, thank you very much, gentlemen, for, for joining us here on, on Ghana tonight.